Hi, and welcome to ComiCast, the podcast that talks about the issues that matter to you. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by a couple of the London recruits, Steve Marsling and Sean Hosey. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and talk about what the London recruits were very briefly. In the 1960s, the ANC had been decimated. The leader, Nelson Mandela, and a significant number of those in the freedom movement were serving long life sentences. Others were either dead or in exile. The apartheid regime boasted that the ANC were defeated and that their racist regime would last a thousand years. A boast that doesn't end well, unless you're the Byzantine Empire, and that didn't end so well either. Oliver Tambo, the new ANC leader, he saw that the regime's propaganda had to be answered. From his base in Tanzania, he summoned a young ANC, the ANC activist, Ronnie Casreels. His task would be to go to London and recruit white activists to go into South Africa to carry out agitational work on behalf of the ANC. Why white people? Well, unlike the black counterparts, white people could move freely around in uh, apartheid South Africa, South Africa and could pose as tourists, business people, and even honeymoon couples. Ronnie travelled to London, enrolled as a student at the London School of Economics, and began the process of recruiting suitable white activists to enter South Africa. Each recruit was sworn to secrecy. They were warned that if they were caught, they would face torture, solitary confinement, and a minimum five-year prison sentence with no remission. Sadly, this was the fate of some of them, as we will hear. First, I'm going to talk to, uh, to Steve, Steve Marsling. Now, Steve was born in the Elephant and Castle in 1951, so a good South East London boy and Millwall fan. Joined the YCL in 1969, involved in setting up the first TUC Youth Conference. He was a Labour Party councillor, 1981 to 1984, and now I'm happy to say he's back in the fold and the secretary of the Suffolk Communist Party and co-founder of the Toothless in Suffolk campaign. Steve, welcome, mate. Thanks very much for joining us. Uh, I'm going to ask you first. Um, we're all getting on a little bit in this podcast, so we know what apartheid actually was. Tell us uh, what it was, what it meant, and how you first heard about it for the benefit of younger listeners, please, Steve. Thank you, Stuart. Good afternoon. Um, I first became involved uh, politically through both my trade union and two issues of the day, which were uh, the Vietnam War and the American invasion of Vietnam. And thanks to the wonderful anti-apartheid movement that was beginning to tell us what life was really like in um, South Africa, uh, where 20% of the population dictated to 80% of the population who never had a vote. Uh, a lot of people say that um, apartheid started in 1948. Well, it didn't. Britain imposed apartheid in 1910 uh, with its constitution. It just became more, more blatant and more visible in 1948 after the Nationalist Party got power. For those young people like ourselves, seeing the kind of uh, treatment that the majority of the population who did the majority of the work uh, were treated not being able to sit on a park bench without permission, not being able to travel by bus or go to the cinema or go to a sports th sports event. And by the time myself and Sean went over there, we were beginning to understand a little bit more about how we could oppose the apartheid regime. And that was down to the anti-apartheid movements, the stop the rugby tours, stop the, stop the cricket tours, don't buy Cape apples. This was beginning to surface. So we, we knew a lot about the opposition that was beginning to build against the anti against the apartheid regime. Okay, Matt, thanks very much indeed. Let's go over to Sean. Uh, Sean, you were born in Dublin in 1949, emigrated with your family to Coventry in 1960, uh, a, a family with a long socialist tradition, and you moved to work in London, age 20, where you were active in the Young Communist League. Uh, you were a campaigner against the Vietnam War and against apartheid. And this led you, of course, into 
uh, the London Recruit. So over to you. When did you first hear about apartheid? And who was who influenced you to sign up for this particular project? Well, much as Steve, I mean, we, we followed a, a similar sort of path and um, uh, became involved in uh, political action at quite a young age. It, in the London phase, it was sort of when I first went down, it was at the height of the campaign against the Vietnam War. Huge demonstrations um, took place uh, in London and in other places. But I'd also heard of uh, apartheid even before that, while I was a very young man in Coventry, and the whites-only sports teams were sent to England and Ireland, unfortunately, at that time. And there were big demonstrations against the whites-only uh, sporting teams, particularly the rugby team um, and occasionally the cricket team. So we were very well aware. And as Steve said, the whole issue of apartheid had come right up the agenda. Uh, Everybody had heard of apartheid and, and even people who were non-political boycotted buying South African fruit and other uh, indirect acts like that to demonstrate their detestation of what apartheid meant. Um, I, just to emphasise what Steve said, I mean, basically uh, it was political, economic and social segregation between white people and black people where 89% of the total land was given to the whites who formed less fraction under 20% of the population. I say separation, but of course they still needed black people to do work and labor for them and bring up their kids as nannies and come in and out of the towns. And so they introduced uh, what became the most hated thing of all by black people, the pass laws, whereby black people had to carry a bulky pass book. And if you were in the wrong area, i.e. in a white area, out of work time, you would be sent to prison. Hundreds of thousands were sent to prison specifically around the, the past laws. Um, on a smaller scale, when we actually went and, and, and saw the thing in front of us, uh, we were horrified, you know, very difficult for people to imagine. Although uh, in some parts of the southern states of America, you know, it's, they're not a million miles removed from it even today. Things like, Signs on public benches, public toilets, uh, buses, beaches, which uh, would, would say blanks, blank, which is Afrikaans for white, or knee blanks, no, no white, uh, sorry, uh, no, no blacks. Uh, horrific signs like that, um, you know, uh, really brought it home to us, the reality of it. We may, have, we may have thought we understood it in theory, but actually going there and seeing these things horrified us and brought it home to us about the reality of the way things were in apartheid South Africa. Yeah, it's interesting, the sporting aspect there, because I, personally I remember the Lions tour to South Africa in 1974, watching that with my father, late night um, highlights. And every time the British Lions scored a try, all the black guys got up and cheered. And I asked my dad yeah. what that was all about. And he explained it. And my father was in the British Army for 30 years and he knew a fair bit about uh, running the empire and what it does to you. Uh, yeah. And he said that that actually, what, what, getting back to what uh, Steve said earlier, this was in many ways a British thing. The empire was run on pretty much apartheid basis. The, uh, the South Africans took over what the Brits had done and institutionalized it to a certain extent. So, um, uh, Sean. Let's go ahead and get, uh, kick off with you on this question. Can you summarise for me what you did when you went across there and what were the implications for you? Well, I mean, as Steve said, we it was a unique opportunity almost in history for us to act and, and our comrades who did much the same at that particular time, being white, um, the, despite the fact that they were so viciously segregationist in, at home, they had a blind spot at that time. Of course, it's changed now. They couldn't conceive of a white person acting against them because why would they? So that gave us an opportunity to uh, do things as white persons over there that uh, nobody else, no, no black people could do, and certainly no black person from outside could do. So it was Ronnie Castles, in collaboration with the ANC High Command abroad, who came up with the idea. Again, let me emphasise this, as you said in your introduction, Stuart, this was uh, the low point, if you like, of resistance 
in South Africa talking about between 68 and, and roughly 71 or 67 and 71, where they effectively uh, imprisoned all of the ANC High Command, Mandela and the others were all by now in prison. And so it was a low point. They, they thought that they had things absolutely wrapped up, the apartheid regime, and that resistance was impossible. So for that unique little gap in history of time, before, before the revolutionary movement then built up a head of steam and eventually uh, overthrew apartheid, there was, this, there was this moratorium, if you like, of, of, of action. And so Ronnie Castles with the High Command came up with this idea that he would recruit and use white people, men and women, um, to go to South Africa undercover and bring in with them uh, via false bottom suitcases, all a bit cloak and daggerish. And uh, of course, the reality of, of how you what you could do in those days is dramatically different than what could be done today. But in those days, it was possible for us to take in false bottom suitcases with some very low grade explosives. I should add at a very early stage, None of, none of the, the things we took in with us or made were uh, anti-personnel. They could not, they, you would have to, have to have stood about a foot above it and perhaps got a, a slight uh, bruise on your nose if, it, if, if this thing had gone under you. So we took in um, leaflets uh, proclaiming that the ANC was still alive uh, and giving, giving soccer and hope to the people who would read these leaflets if we could get them to work. Um, and we did. Uh, placed it on that first mission with Steve, we placed six what we call bucket bombs. We had to construct, purchase, uh, carefully purchase um, some, uh, some bu literally buckets, like washing up buckets, and then constructing them on platforms, uh, the, the, the device which threw, threw the leaflets up into the air on a, on a, uh, using a timer to set off the, the small explosives, threw these leaflets 100 feet up into the air, very spectacularly like a shower. And we placed these in strategic places around the station, for example, and timed, it, timed them to go off when there would be maximum presence of black workers coming uh, off the trains and in other places. Basically, that, that was what we did. Uh, on the first trip. In the long run, what good do you think it did? What did you guys achieve? And Sean, what were the implications for you on a personal basis? Well, let me, let me deal with that in three bits. It, it, the immediate effect, um, we, we, we discovered the day after we did our, our work in Cape Town that similar uh, teams of people had gone into five other cities. So this spectacular uh, event happened at exactly the same time, five o'clock in the afternoon, in, in in six cities in South Africa, which had a, a dramatic impact. You know, screaming headlines in the papers, uh, police absolutely um, running around trying to find us. In, in the film, London Recruits, which hopefully we'll talk about a little bit later, there is a very interesting interview with actually one of the security policemen at the time explaining that they hadn't got a clue how this had happened at Flummoxton. They launched the biggest manhunt in South African history to try and find us and the other people. So in the short term, it had a hugely dramatic effect. The film also interviews some uh, people, uh, black people, who were around at the time, and they've described the impact that these leaflets had on them. Uh, you know, they didn't know who had planted them. All they knew, the ANC had succeeded spectacularly in doing this thing in six cities simultaneously at exactly five o'clock. That was impressive. And uh, we know from the interviews uh, with, with people who picked up leaflets at that time that it had an impact on them, an encouragement, an encouraged to fight. The fight was not over. It was, it was you know, it, was, it, it seems to have been important at that short term. Now, Steve and I would never claim to have, you know, have, have had major parts in, in the South African Revolution, but we had a what I like to think of a very small walk on part in the war to quote a, a wonderful song. Um, I can't remember who sung it, but anyway, lovely line. And then in the longer term, uh, you know, um, uh, the South African people clearly took up, took up the mantle themselves and led their own revolution. But I'd like, I'd like to think that we have certainly in the museum of apartheid in Johannesburg, we, we, the, the London recruits are mentioned 
and uh, are spoken of. Mandela spoke of it. Oliver Tambo spoke of it. And, and lots of the, the government ministers and what have you in South Africa over the time have, have mentioned the effort of the London recruits. I don't wish to exaggerate it. It was a tiny, tiny, tiny gesture. But uh, I would like to think did have some uh, help, you know, helpfulness and, and contribution towards what subsequently happened in South Africa, i.e. the ending of apartheid. Okay, Sean, thanks very much indeed for that. Um, Steve, over to yourself, mate. What's your perspective on that same range of issues? Well, first of all, can I speak a little bit about how we were recruited? Because uh, um, we were asked, or I was asked by um, Bob Allen, who was the full-time district secretary of the Young Communist League, um, to meet. Ronnie Casrals. He didn't say anything else. He just said, "You've got to meet this chap." And can you can you think of somebody who could come with you? Um, and I said, "Well, my, got me mate Sean." He said, "That's a brilliant, um, brilliant suggestion." You and Sean go and meet um, Ronnie Casrals. And Ronnie said to me, "Said to me and Sean, look, I'm not kidding you. This is dangerous." If you get caught, you'll be beaten, you'll be, you know, tortured, you'll be thrown into solitary confinement, and you'll have five years minimum uh, imprisonment, and there's no remission for political prisoners. If they say five years, you'll do five years. So before we start, you need to think about that um, and whether you're whether you're up for it. Well, we hated the apartheid regime, both myself and Sean and had spoken about it. So it didn't take us long to say, OK, we're in. And then he started to teach us how to make the, the bombs and, and how, to, um, how to learn a little bit about tradecraft, make sure you're not followed and do various things. We had various tests which we had to do. Um, and so the day came when we were flying out to South Africa. I mean... To be honest, Stuart, you know, the nearest I'd been to abroad was a few Millwall away games at Brighton and South End. So for me to be suddenly going halfway around the world, I know Sean was exactly the same. You know, we just thought, blimey, you know, they're trusting us with this. And so it was frightening, but you lose your fear when you see the signs blanc, non blanc, when you see the disgusting treatment of the majority of the population, how they're cowed and beaten because you get angry. And the anger overcomes the fear. You feel that you've got to do something. You're in that situation, and yet you might get caught or you might not. We came close to getting caught on two occasions. One, we had a dodgy timer. Um, and, but we thought we'd go ahead and use it anyway. And so one of the bombs, we took it in turns to plant them and move the, move the timer back 20 minutes so we could get clear before it went off. And this blooming timer, I put it down and it started to go straight away. Uh, and it was going to hit the detonator. It was going to explode. And, of course, almost certainly we'd have been caught. So, you know, when you're young, you don't worry too much. And I had long fingernails then, so I jammed the fingernail in between the detonator. I looked up at Sean. He was white as a sheet, and I must have been even whiter. And I slowly moved it back for about 10, 20 minutes. And um, it stayed. Big sigh of relief, and we just cleared off and continued with the other bombs, um, which went off. Perfectly. The next day, we were uh, we had bad airport tickets. Um, they said Cape Town to London, and and the the when we got to the airport, they said there's no such plane. You've got to go to. Um, you'll have to stop in 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 Salisbury, which is now you know was then Rhodesia and Salisbury, not Harare. Uh, and we thought we were late for the tri for the uh, uh, plane. So we started running, and <laughs> as Sean remembers, we got on the wrong side of a couple of guards who were drawing their guns and saying, what do you think you're doing running in the airport? 
and um, we just froze and said, look, we're very sorry, we don't know what we're doing, etc. And um, they did ask for our passports and they didn't seem to, you know, they were thinking, and they just said, on your way, you've got time, you don't have to run. So that was two scary moments in that. But yes, it was a success. It was a tremendous success. It was on the front page of the Cape Town News. It was on the front page of the um, Rhodesian News. It was big. And it was great for us to know that there were six, five other bombs going off in different towns at the same time. It was a fantastic uh, feeling because you felt we were part of a community that was fighting back. Um, so when we got back into London, Ronnie Casrals was absolutely delighted. And, of course, that's it. You can't tell anybody. Me and Sean, have, well, not Sean because of subsequent events that no doubt he'll tell us about in a minute, but we couldn't tell anybody, and we held that secret for about 35 years, uh, and nobody knew who we were. We didn't know anybody else. So that when we actually did go to the Houses of Parliament, uh, Peter Hain uh, um, booked a, a room. People were saying, oh, I didn't know you when. I didn't know you. Yeah, well, you were there. Well, I used to work with you. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was. I went over to South Africa. So it was a kind of strange reunion when we all, all got together because there were so many people there that I knew, but I hadn't a clue they'd been to South Africa. We kept our secrets. We were good comrades. And may I just say, as a passing, I don't want to get too, um, too partisan, but of the recruits, 70% of them were YCO members at that time, Young Communist League members. Uh, it's not been too partisan. If it's factual there, Steve, that's no problem at all. It's factual. <laughs> right. One thing I should have actually asked you guys before, how old were you whenever you were doing all this? Um, well, I was 20. And Sean? Uh, I just turned 21. So you were kids, and how long did it go on for, and how did you get out? Um, what do you mean? You mean the first... The, the, what, how long were you doing a recruit gig where you were going to South Africa and letting off these information bombs? Um, well, that, that we did that once, and I, I, I uh, did other things. And the, when I went to do a, a different mission the following year, which was on the face of it a much simpler mission, mm -hmm. i.e. taking, I've talked about these passports that people had to carry. So I was carrying in, again, through a false bottom suitcase, half a dozen uh, passports, forged passports, obviously, so that six, uh, six people who'd been fighters who'd been brought in, because things were moving ahead now, people were coming back into South Africa, black people who'd been trained in various parts of the world, uh, up and down Africa, GDR, Soviet Union, some, etc., were now were now coming back in. The action was about to begin in earnest. And um, so these people needed documents to enable them to move around the country. So I was taking six documents and, and, the, and the pile of money in to help them, um, you know, live. Uh, and, and my mission was to meet somebody uh, in a place called Tongart, which was right down uh, near Durban on the... Uh, Way out in the country in a, a sugar near a sugar plantation, and um, give this person the six passports and the money. We of course, uh, you know, we 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 had passwords and, and uh, tests to, for each other before I gave them uh, the stuff over to this guy. So I got there, and the guy had all the proper passwords. He also looked exactly like the fellow I was meant to meet. Gave, passed over all the stuff, um, turned to walk away, and then heard the words that stayed with me for a long time after, hold it, boss, because boss was what black people call white people in South Africa. As soon as he said that, I realised, bloody hell, something's not right here. This com comrade would not be calling me boss. We don't, you know, we don't operate like that uh, as, as comrades and black and white comrades. Anyway, shortly after then, you know, within seconds, there were half a dozen heavily armed white cops uh, with, their, with their machine guns pointing at my midriff. And I was arrested uh, and interrogated then um, off and on for eight months or in solitary confinement for most of that. 
And eventually, anyway, they charged me under the notorious Terrorism Act, which was a catch-all act. You could be charged with terrorism for putting a light bulb into a bloody train or something. Any, anything they wanted to uh, politically pin on people fell under the Terrorism Act. Um, and I was sentenced to five years in prison, which I did to the day. So I did the total of five years and eight months uh, in prison in South Africa for it. So Ronnie's, Ronnie's unfortunate warning came to fruition in my case, and everything he uh, warned us about was true and happened to me uh, with a vengeance. But so ending up in a South African political prison, I mean, they, they were so crazy that even they, they segregated their prisons into black and white political prisoners. So you had Mandela black prisoners on Robin Island and the white political prisoners in a uh, top security prison in Pretoria, which was the, the capital. Um, and that's where I, I spent uh, the next five years and eight months of my, my life. Um, however, it's worth mentioning that not all of that was negative. I met some of the most incredible and bravest people I've ever met in my life, people like Bram Fisher, Dennis Goldberg, who were white political prisoners who were doing life sentences. When I got there, they said, uh, well, how long have you got? I said, five years. And I think it was Dave Kitts, an English trade unionist who was also a political prisoner, said, blimey, mate, he said, that's a parking ticket, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Compared, compared to them, it was. They'd been in there for years and years and years and would be in there for years more. Bram Fisher, indeed, would die in there virtually. Um, I also had the unfortunate pleasure of spending a little bit of time up on their death row because that was also part of the prison. And this is where hundreds, literally hundreds of black prisoners were awaiting the death penalty, uh, were housed, housed or imprisoned in. Um, and every week, I only spent a few days in that particular bit, but I was there enough to hear uh, one Thursday. Thursdays were hanging days, Stuart. They used to hang all oh, eight, eight of them virtually every week. Uh, and you, I was there one Thursday. Peculiarly, they, they were served, they were told they were going to be hanged on the Wednesday before the Thursday. And they were presented with a, a, a um, a form, as it were, a black bordered form with, with, from the state president, which began with greetings, you will be hanged tomorrow, um, <laughs> which is not funny, of course, but, 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 but madly ironic and, and dreadful. Anyway, so the eight were named and they would have to then sit through the night of Wednesday before being taken out at six o'clock to be hanged. And it was there I heard, and this is a scene in the film, which is um, quite moving, I think. It was there I, I heard what happened. So the eight who were to be hanged were comforted by the hundreds of other their comrades and, and, and people in prison with them who also were waiting to be hanged. Their turn might be the following Wednesday and Thursday. But they would break into a, broke into a spontaneous and wonderfully lyrical and deeply moving um, singing. They would sing. Literally, they would sing, and if you've heard, particularly in South Africa, the sort of um, collective singing that people can do, the emotion of it and the drama of it, it's 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 beyond belief, stunning. But this was this was a, an act. They were all doomed. They were all going to be hanged at some point next week or in a few weeks' time. But they, the, those that weren't being hanged the following day sang to comfort the eight that were going to be. And they sang right through the night until uh, exactly six o'clock. At the moment, until the exact moment of hanging at six o'clock, they sang for 14 hours relentlessly uh, and, and, you know, courageously um, and stopped at the exact moment those people were hanged. Now, that was a killing factory. But to me, you see, that, that, that was the, the highest and, and um, most barbarous expression of what apartheid was. That was the end of it. They were literally killing people there. A lot of these people were there for all sorts of reasons, mainly because of poverty or whatever, or, uh, you know, I, I would argue as a direct result of what apartheid did to them economically and socially, and then they would be killed and murdered. I, I met subsequently the, doc the, the prison doctor who was our prison doctor, who I know 
would uh, administer, uh, in the event that they, the rope hadn't done its work, he would administer um, a kill, an injection. And I said to him, well, how the hell do you square that with the Hippocratic Oath, mate? Um, that got me at four days without food in what we call the hole, <laughs> but it was worth it. Anyway, so yes, drama, Stuart, drama, and not a waste of time. It was, it was wonderfully encouraging and inspirational to have met people like Bram Fisher, who gave their lives, literally gave their lives, uh, as an opponent of apartheid. Bram Fisher, for example, was an Africana man. His father was state, uh, was state uh, president of the Transvaal, or uh, head of the court. Bram probably, possibly could have become prime minister of South Africa if he'd adhered to the doctrinaire apartheid system. But he, he did not. He took an opposite path and paid for it with his life. Courageous beyond belief, but inspiring beyond belief too. Sean, thanks very much indeed for sharing that with us. That's uh, kind of inspirational to listen to, albeit in many ways very depressing. Um, I'm sure the British, nor indeed the Irish government, did anything to help you during this period. Did at any point the British government want to step in and say, leave um, the there, was some, there was There was some activity. I think, uh, who was that? Oh, God, uh, the, 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 the Home Secretary that suddenly, suddenly joined the Social Democrats. What was his name? I oh, can't remember his name. There was some activity. The Irish government made representations, and I was visited quite often by the Irish consul in in uh, in Pretoria. Um, I did meet uh, Jack Jones and Vic Feather, then uh, president and uh, president of the TUC, and uh, Jack Jones was head of the TNG, I think. Um, came to visit me and uh, lend me a bit of support. Uh, Vic, 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 Vic occupied the the guards, the the very senior people they tend to sit with him. While Jack Jones gave me um, some information. One thing, if I could just say to you, Stuart, what one of the ma many many things they did, uh, the the regime did to the prisoners, to the political prisoners, which was particularly uh, cruel, and left a site left a psychological trace on people, damaged people, was that they banned all news of the world. No newspapers, no broadcasts, no magazines, nothing. Because they believed if political prisoners had access to news, they could somehow influence events in the outside world. Now, that may not seem, uh, you know, such a terrible, terrible thing to people. But I say to your listeners, try, try, try and put yourself off from all news in any form for five days and see how you feel, particularly if you're interested in what's going on in the world. Imagine that for 20 years which is what some of them had. Uh, uh, and it, you know, no, no form of news of the world, any letters from home or friends or family that contained the remotest mention, even the football score, for Christ's sake, they would, they would cut out. So quite often people would get their letters with huge chunks cut out, which was you couldn't show that they were getting to you, obviously, because then they'd just crucify you. But it, it was very, very difficult. And that was... A very, very cruel psychological thing to do to, to cut people off from news. There were many other things, but that was a particularly bad one. Um, yeah. Yeah, I can understand that, mate. And uh, without in any way trivializing what you've said, uh, given the fact the last five days of news has all been about the death of the Queen, I would probably welcome a little bit of an isolation from <laughs> the news myself here. Anyway, yeah. uh, on a lighter note, um, let's move on now to. Uh, to Steve, Sean, thank you very much for all that. That was moving and, uh, like I say, deeply yeah. inspirational. Steve, how do we educate people so that they don't forget the murderous barbarity of apartheid? What can we do to help identify, I guess, its manifestation under different names in other countries? What can we do, Mike? Before we just get on to that, can I just say, because um, we're talking about the state, um, Sean took my place at the last minute I'd gone into teachers training college and um, I was asked to go out and then I said oh I don't think I can because I'm going I've got teaching practice and Sean said yeah I'll do it and we thought it was all easy and that so you can imagine myself and Ronnie's reaction when we found out that um, Sean 
hadn't sent us the postcard because he was obviously in some kind of trouble. So I immediately cleared his flat uh, from his very good landlady. But the kind of, we're talking about the British state, my phone was tapped as it was coming up to, to Sean's um, uh, trial. I was followed around by members of the Bureau of State Security. And if you add also the fact that the um, South African Secret Police came into London and bombed the ANC headquarters in Penton Street, which we now know uh, because under the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, they actually admitted that they did this. This was all in connivance with the British state. The British state actually supported apartheid literally 100%. And... You know, that's why it's so important for people to find out, to see that, you know, our state, while it is ostensibly a democracy, it's also, if it suits its interests, will support the most vile regimes across the world. So what can be done? Going back to your question. Well, of course, we got this film, which is coming out very soon. It's 95% finished now. Uh, we've got a teacher's pack that uh, I coordinated, which is now about to go into schools. It's finished. It's completed. We've got a book about um, what London recruits did, which was edited by Ken Keeble when he was given permission to try and find us all and sort us out so we could make a record of it. We've even got a L London recruit Iris Flower. Someone was inspired by our story, a great... Um, um, one of the leading world's gardeners, a um, very friend of mine, Barry Emerson, and he said, I want a dark uh, iris, sort of reddish black with a yellow inside, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to develop it, and I'm going to call it London Recruit. And he's done so, and it's now been a certificate. Also, of course, in Penton Street, he's going to be given over. It's now been rebuilt. There's going to be a centre of memory and learning where people can go and understand what apartheid was, what the resistance was, and find out a little bit more about it. This is like a, going to be a museum, and it's in the former South African headquarters. That's likely to be open from the beginning of 2024. The money's there. Uh, it's been given, you know, it's virtually, it's, ready to start the building works. The architectural designs are there. So that's very exciting as well. So we've got a teacher's pack going into schools. We've got a film that will coincide with it. We've got a flower with our name on it. And we've also got a building that is going to commemorate both here, of course, and there's commemorations all over South Africa as well. We need to keep this memory alive. Absolutely, and one of the reasons why we're doing the podcast. Uh, I think it's also it's worth mentioning regarding the way the Tory party in particular supported apartheid. David Cameron, as I recall, as a young Tory, was sent to South Africa to dig out some dirt on Nelson Mandela and try and make out he was just a regular terrorist uh, rather than the, the man that he actually was and, of course, the inter great international figure he became. The Tories... I remember Thatcher boasting about how she gave away just a tiny little bit in some negotiations about sanctions. Right, the, the apartheid regime was backed up by the Tories. Sorry, Steve, come in. That's that's very yeah. true. A lot of the um, uh, Tory young Tory MPs and that had hang Mandela badges, uh, something they don't want to talk about now. Um, and, and generally speaking, they were very, very pro South Africa, very, very pro keeping all white sporting tours. And only when the um, African working class were beginning to win and um, they lost a major war in Angola to the Cuban forces and Namibia got its independence, did they start to back away and thinking, hang on, we might have back to lose it here. And as the Soviet Union uh, collapsed uh, in 1991, South Africa was considered a little bit of an embarrassment. And certain companies like Barclays, who had been supporting it, you know, and keeping it maintained, suddenly wanted to, to, to withdraw a little bit of support. 
And it was made very clear to the white South African regime, you've got to negotiate because they were bankrupt anyway. They were literally losing money and over fist. So that's how there was a, several factors. They were losing the war. And also the capitalist class said, you better negotiate and try and get some kind of uh, consensus with the, all the people. And that's how uh, the regime was defeated. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Sean, over to yourself. Um, I was going to ask about internationalism here. Being a recruit is often referred to as an act of internationalism. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. How would you define internationalism? And what is its role today, given your preferred definition of it? Yeah, I, I, that's that's quite quite a difficult question in some ways. I mean, let, let me come at it from from an angle that. When I was brought up um, as a, a young lad, as I said, a socialist family, um, quite often back and they were talking about now the right the early 60s, I was about 10, I can recall people coming to my house who were veterans of the Spanish Civil War who'd fought against fascism and fought against um, Franco in it. I can quite remember them coming in and talking a little bit about that. Some of them, some of them had suffered terribly, lost legs, all sorts of stuff. Um, but to me, that was my first sort of clear recognition and understanding of what internationalism meant. These young men and women that had gone off to fight against fascism in Spain, this is before the Second World War, many of them gave their lives for it. Uh, and to me, that will always be a shining example of, of a form of internationalism, you know. Um, then I would also describe our experience in campaigning against the Vietnam War for the Vietnamese people. I can recall again meeting uh, two women in particular who'd come over uh, from Vietnam to, to, to talk about and explain their fight against what America was doing to them at the time, appalling murderous campaigns, Napalm, and horrendous stuff like that. Clearly, uh, I, would, I would argue that the, the movement against the Vietnam War uh, supported heavily by the YCL in those days and many other people was it was a sort of act of internationalism as well showing support and expression for other people's struggle then apartheid well we've talked about our particular role in that yes of course it was a form of internationalism you know we're going from from England to South Africa to, to help participate when that was needed it wouldn't it wouldn't it wouldn't wasn't needed shortly afterwards it wasn't needed necessarily before but at that so to me all of those things are uh, expressions of internationalism. Um, I suppose the only thing, it, it, the difficulty I've got in defining it is, it, to me, it has to be clarified that you are, or in the current times, you you only act in 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 a way that you're asked to act by the people most involved in the struggle. Now, today, for people, I mean, the concept of going about with false bottom suitcase and having the modern world, of course, is nonsense. That could never happen. So it was of its time. And well, currently, if you're a young person considering, well, how can I be an internationalist? Well, just listen to what's being said by people all over the world. And Palestine is clearly, clearly, uh, you know, a, a very important one, but lots of other places. But only act in a way that they want you to act um, at the appropriate time. Now, what me and Steve and the other people, the other London recruits did was of its time, of a, as I said, a particular moment in history, which will probably never be repeated in quite that way. But it's born out, born out of a spirit of compassion and, and care for other people and particularly their struggles against regimes like the apartheid regime and other ones. People today, young people in particular, will have to judge and, and keep their ears and eyes open and listen to what's been said by other people in the world and listen to what they want them to do as an act of internationalism and try and try and do their best to do that. But pay, at, at its heart is uh, a philosophy of supporting people in, in their struggles against the murderous, racist, apartheid regime and others. I don't want to start going into today's world too much. I'm 73 now. My time is done, as it were. But nevertheless, my advice to young people is listen and respond as well as you can when you're clear that the struggle uh, that, that you're, you're being asked to support is valid and right. 
Your time's not done when you pass on good advice like that. Okay, mate. Thanks very much indeed. Steve, over to you with the same questions about internationalism. Well, I mean, internationalism is, is uh, I mean, I'll give you, I mean, Sean's given us some great examples of Spain and the, and the Vietnam. And uh, if I can add, add a couple more, um, the London Dockers refusing to load the Jolly George ship when they found out that they were going to be armaments and they were going to be used against uh, the new Soviet regime. Uh, they refused point blank and said, no, we're not, um, we're not going to load them. And the Scottish workers who found out that um, they were uh, producing aircraft parts for the Pinochet Chile regime in the uh, 1970s, and they blacked them and they refused to, um, to uh, work on them because they were not going to um, be a part of a, um, a, an, a murderous regime like the Pinochet regime. Um, internationalism. And let's, first of all, let's look at some of these issues. So, you know, if we look at, because some people say, oh, what's the point? What's the point? You know, well, Spain is now a democracy. Um, Chile is now a, de a democracy. South Africa, we won. We actually won. You know, the people of South Africa now have the right to change their regime. Whatever we think about South African politics, they now have the right. And also, there are no signs telling them where they can sit, what cinema they can go to. These are big things. Uh, so I would say to people, when you start campaigning in, on an international issue, just look at some of the examples of what we've done and what we've succeeded. I think that, you know, so many times people are put off, but if they actually look at where we started from and how we've ended up, then there is hope for great optimism. Sometimes, I mean, you know, I was at a demonstration, medical aid for, for Palestine, and people were saying to me, well, why are we doing, you know, it, it looks bleak, it looks bleak. I said, yes, it looks bleak now, but if you don't get involved, it will be even bleaker, won't it? So I always say to people, always get involved. Don't matter what you do, even if it's a click on a button, I prefer it to be more, a demonstration. Because all those demonstrations, you know, when people say, well, what was the point? What was the point of going and stop the tours? Well, it stopped the tours. We won. We did stop the tours. What was the point of going on that Vietnam? Well, America ran away. They withdrew. So, yes, there was a point. You should never be cynical because if you're cynical, you'll end up doing nothing. And that's the worst thing you can do. If you see something that's wrong, I would say to young people, like the fantastic response of the school children to the climate change issues, I applaud them. And I would turn around and say to anyone, you know, if you feel strongly about something, get involved in some way and don't let people put you off. That's internationalism. Also regarding Vietnam, it's interesting there. One of the things that kept uh, Britain out of Vietnam was Wilson was terrified after the Grosvenor Square demonstration and the riot afterwards, where the police basically beat the crap out of the demonstrators. He was terrified of that taking place all over Britain if we got involved. And that's one of the reasons why Britain didn't get involved in that war. So, yeah, get out there and demonstrate and do stuff. And if things look bleak, that's an argument for doing something rather than doing nothing. Anyway, enough of me preaching here. I'm going to go across to you now, Sean, for closing remarks. And in your closing remarks, please talk to us about the relevance for today of what you guys did. I think Steve's kind of done that already, but I want to hear your uh, take on that as well, please. Yeah. Um, well, well, clearly in South Africa itself, there was relevance of part, you know, a little bit of walk on part of the war, as I've described it. And, and and the 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 leading to democracy in South Africa. Oddly enough, Stuart, I am um, I'm not one to quote uh, royalty, but I did hear one thing today on a program yesterday about the Queen's role in in the Commonwealth, mm -hmm. and actually, it's reputed that she did uh, oppose Margaret Thatcher 
um, in refusing to impose sanctions. It's reputed that she did support it. Of course, that, that's where she left it. However, she made a speech in 95 um, as, head, as head of the Commonwealth where she said that South Africa had come through a turmoil and there could be no turning back. That, that was the expression she used meaning uh, clearly there could be no return to apartheid. It was done and dusted forever. Um, so clear, clearly the implication of that. Also, you know, we've got a prime minister today, Miss Truss, who uh, likes to model herself on Margaret Thatcher. So I think, you know, there's a, there's a lesson for us and in educating others that don't always assume that once something happens, progressive happens, it will be maintained. It can be attacked again and will be attacked. And this present Tory government, I think, is capable of attacking virtually everything that has been won. Um, so, you know, that's a lesson. Don't ever take things for granted. Look at look at trade unions. Look at the attack on trade union rights. Look at this so-called attack on red tape that we're going to be seeing from the present government. And so the lesson is uh, you've got to keep defending things you've won. Um, South Africa will have to keep defending its democracy. But as Steve said, you know, no matter what you may think, and there's lots to be said about, unfortunately, corruption and what have you in South Africa, and we, we, it can't be denied and hit. It needs to be faced down. But that's that's not the issue we were dealing with at the time. It was right to do what we did. It was right that apartheid was beaten. Um, and, you know, I went, to, I went back to South Africa. They, they awarded me a medal. I went back to collect it. it and um, I was in a hotel the night before the, the, the reception. There was a big fly pass, military fly pass, all of that. But I was, I was sitting in a hotel where there was a conference going on and a lot of young South African black people, men and women. Um, and it was, it, 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 it was a, a session being given by Price Waterhouse on how to be very good capitalists um, <laughs> for these young people. And I thought, oh, Christ, it really... What was the point of what we did when really all they're getting is more of the same shit we get everywhere else? But then I thought, well, hang on a minute. Um, you know, what am I doing here? It's not that's their decision in a way. That's their decision. They have the right to be in the hotel, which they couldn't have been in before apartheid. They're sitting there, they're having they're in nice rooms. Whatever else they may decide going forward is their business. Hopefully they'll make decisions that I would like, and if they don't, they don't. Important point is they were they were in a position to be able to do it. They could go and have a drink in a bar whenever they liked, wherever they liked, and, and, and interact with each other and what have you. That wasn't possible before apartheid. So, you know, that, that, that was important. But I do I do think in the current climate that, you know, we're, we're, we're in for a tough two, three, four, five years in this country. And I think a lot of the things that people – take for granted rights that rights that have, you know uh, that they have and it, it it's it wouldn't be amiss if people thought well, hang on how the hell did those rights come about and in the majority of cases then it came around because people fought for them back to steve's point people demonstrated people went people made sacrifices of all sorts of things don't betray those sacrifices you know and the only way you're going to not betray those sacrifices is what steve said a minute ago is participate, look about you, um, fight to defend those freedoms. Absolutely. The ruling class gives up nothing without a fight, as somebody else may have said before. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Matt. Steve, over to you for your concluding remarks, please. Well, I can only conclude 100% on, on Sean's previous remarks there. You know, all I would say to young people, and I hope that – a lot of young Communist League people and other people are going to be listening to this comic cast, is, you know, you can change. You can make change. But we have to be aware of the dangers. What happened to um, the Jeremy Corbyn project is a case in point of when I think, you know, you turn the other cheek once too much. I mean, the ruling class were ruthless. And unfortunately... I think the Labour Party now has become um, 
an arm of the establishment under Starmer, the former director of public prosecutions, who worked so closely with our own special branch when he was the director of public prosecutions. So extra parliamentary action is absolutely vital, both on an international front and on defending our rights and extending our rights at work and uh, fighting, you know, for better housing. I mean, you know, we're in a situation now where me and Sean in the 50s and 60s could walk up the high street and go to a dentist and get treatment. Young people today can't do that because there are no NHS dentists, and that's what I've been fighting for for the last couple of years. There are no NHS dentists, so we're going backwards. Our National Health Service is nowhere near as good as it was 30, 40 years ago. So we have to be aware and we have to publicise these, these, um, th th these setbacks and fight for a proper National Health Service, for proper trade union rights, for proper housing rights, so that generation rent, which is what's become, uh, get a far, far better deal than they are now. We need to be fighting for tenants. And we have to do that because the Labour Party at the moment is not doing that. And there is no one except ourselves. There are, it's at ourselves that we've got to organise with the trade unions, with the tenants associations, with the green movements to try and put together a mass movement that will actually change things. We cannot rely on politicians in Westminster to defend us. They'll always find a reason not to. And so my call is that we have to you know, we have to get behind the trades councils and, and just generally speaking Stuart form a movement on all fronts to defend and extend that's very important extend our rights as citizens in this country and in the world solidarity Absolutely, mate. And this is not a time in which we can afford to be in any way sectarian. We have to work across a wide variety. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. On that note, uh, we have to end. It's been a rare privilege to talk to you two this afternoon. Thank you very much indeed. Um, this has been Comicast. We are anti-fascist, anti-racist, and very much anti-apartheid. Thank you very much indeed for listening, and thanks again to Sean and to Steve. Good night. <laughs>